So, thank you everyone for tuning it for tuning in to yet another episode in which I'm going to talk about issues related to public transportation and we're going to talk about a really fun topic today which is fun. Uh and I would uh, raise my uh right hand like in the like very cringe way of a uh a day camp uh counselor uh except my uh right arm still hurts and therefore I can't uh properly lift it yet. Uh Please post this in Discord, it's really cool. Uh, and, um, yeah, so, jokes aside, uh, cities, yeah, so cities are mostly places of production, but they're also places of consumption. Uh, so if you use public transportation to get around, you might as well also use it to get around for purposes of fun and not just work. Now, there is someone in like my orbit of like the internet named Nilo Kova who may have different views on it. Uh, that's how you spell his name. Uh, I tried Googling just before streaming and it wasn't, just before recording, and I didn't get any good reference to it. Like he was the main character on Twitter I think two and a half years ago for saying cities are not about fun. Uh, much, uh, quote, dunking happened, uh, but public transportation can be used not just to get people to work and back, but also for other things. Now, I have talked before about leisure, about leisure by train, and I'm going to be a little more focused this time, so, um, the examples of, for, uh, so, so the example of Grand Canyon is kind of out of scope, so I'm going to, I'm not, I'm going to not talk about issues of mainline rail. I, I've talked about this before, I've talked about how some specific vistas uh, are famous not just because they're objectively pretty, I mean there's objectively pretty stuff in places where there's no transportation. I don't mean no transportation in the sense of uh, kind of difficult to get there, I mean literally like probably tens of kilometers from the nearest paved road. Uh, there's a there was this person who was going to like the ass end of somewhere in Canada, and again I don't mean a ten kilometer hiking trail. I mean like the actual ass end to see what had been caught on satellite as the world's largest beaver dam or something. So objectively, it's a nice vista, but the reason people don't go there and they do go to let's say Niagara Falls or the Alps or whatever is that it is the railroads get you to some places or it's when the roads get you to some places but not others. But anyway that's kind of out of scope. I'm going to talk more about fun within cities. So fundamentally Nilo is more right than wrong. Um, and there's actually a way to know that Nilo is more right than wrong, that um, cities arise economically as places of production, not consumption, and that is um, usually consumption amenities, and there's a lot of economic literature on this. Um, consumption amenities tend to reduce incomes. It's not because it's because if it's nice and you automatically become poor, no, it's not. Um, if you have a consumption amenity, um, and the example that I'm thinking of is uh, improvements in public health uh, in cities specifically, so things like running water in the homes of the working class, uh, sewer systems, things like that. Um, uh, these led to massive improvements in uh, the, the state of urban public health. Uh, previously to those, uh, life expectancy was higher in rural areas than in cities in the same country or region, just because the cities have a lot of circulating diseases. Um, due to high population density, and these uh, public health improvements uh, flipped that. Um, and afterward, uh, I think starting maybe in the 1920s, urban life expectancy overtook rural life expectancy, again, same country, same region. Uh, and um, at least in the United States, uh, that process was also was associated with a large reduction in the urban wage premium. So in the uh, ratio of urban to rural wages. Essentially, previously, cities were so filthy people had to uh, 
get paid much more than in rural areas to be willing to migrate to the cities. Uh, and afterward, uh, the consumption amenity of public health meant that they didn't. So it was so 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 uh, employers could build you know, more marginal factories that could pay lower wages and the. I mean, not, not literally lower wages, wages increased with this era, but they increased faster in rural than in urban areas for that reason. Um, whereas production amenities, what they do is they increase the local wage, the, the local wage premium, because it means that employers are going to be more willing to locate in the city, even if they have to pay higher wages to attract workers. Uh, and that's actually been a big uh, fight in some places, San Francisco is a big one. San Franciscans, it's the kind of San Franciscans who became the first NBAs. Um, they in the nineteen seventies and eighties they heavily trumpeted the city's consumption amenities, like the weather. It's kind of weird to call San Francisco a city of good weather, but I mean, if you just moved from New York, then sure. Um, but um, if the ah, uh, huh, okay. But um, if you're, um, but, but if the point of a city is good weather, people will move there even without an income. Um, I think Southern Europe has some of that at this point. That people just move there. Um, usually, people usually retirees maybe move there for for the warmth. Uh, I think the United States Santa Fe uh, has that. Um, you know, the, the people go there because they like the atmosphere or something, and then. There isn't much of a. Uh, there isn't much work there unless you're like a, a best-selling science fiction author, and um, the. Uh, but for the most part, cities. Like, but I mean, Santa Fe is small, and, um, and usually urban growth doesn't come from that. It comes from things that also increase the wage. So this is what I mean by production rather than consumption amenities. However, however, um, the city's size means that fun will want to locate there. I mean, if I want to open a club. Now forget, okay, maybe club, maybe club is not the best example because in Germany, if I want to open a club, I will do it in Berlin just because Berlin is a city with a very strong clubbing scene. So, um, uh, um, so it's easier to find. I don't so I, because I don't know clubs at all. I, I cannot. I can't even do the, the usual thing of listing the various things that one needs to open a club um, beyond clients or things like I don't know a DJ or uh, to know where, where I can get uh, where I can vet good bouncers you now to get whatever you need for for the club. I mean, preferably if it's not kind of club, I don't know. Um, and that's just going to be easier to get in Berlin than in, I don't know, random East German towns. Um, but again, that's maybe Berlin having a special club scene, but that would also be true if I needed to choose between Frankfurt uh, and a random small town. Like, I mean, the, um, the, the, the fun is something where you want to be near the clients. You want to be near the, the customers. And once the customers are in a specific place, that's where the fun will go. And in that case, it's kind of weird because then the consumption and the production amenities kind of co-locate. And, um, and so the, um, and, and, and so usually the, the, the fun is going to be urban. Um, and usually the exceptions are in places that are incredibly auto-oriented. Uh, the United States is one such example, but it doesn't have to be the United States. Actually, um, France is a really good example of this because uh, a big place that was designed for simultaneously fun and office work is Mont La Vallée. Because Mont La Vallée was designed as a kind of as a suburban edge city, as a, as a place to create work east of Paris and not just in or west of Paris. Uh, but there's also Disneyland. Um, there's also Euro Disney. I don't know if they're if the official name is Euro Disney or Disneyland. I think it's changed its name. I don't remember from which one to which one. But this is very much a place where if you're into that, it's fun. Uh, and um, the location is not random. The location is 
right, is very close to the city. It's uh, designed. To, it, it, it was built. It was built at the same time as public transportation to get there. Um, it might not be clear. Um, so if you're watching this very regularly, you know the history. Uh, and uh, no, Magna Valle is the general region. Uh, Disneyland is the name of the actual Disney. Thing. Like Disneyland is in Magna Valle. Yeah, or Euro Disney again. I'm forgetting what it's called. Um, and so, for people who don't know, um, the era is not just a bunch of old commuter lines that were joined together. The RR has some such lines. So for example, on the RRA, this line, the line to Boissy, uh, is old. Um, you can even see traces of the old line. Uh, and a little bit of the old right-of-way was subsequently used uh, as a transition line from, uh, from the legacy line to a high-speed line here. Um, but, uh, and then this line was connected, so, so this is the old part, and then this was connected through a city center tunnel to some old lines west of Paris. Uh, but some of the branches are new. Uh, and, uh, the one to, and the entire branch of Marne Valle is, uh, is entirely new. Uh, it was built in stages, and the, lar uh, the, large, the last part of it, which was about this, opened, I believe, 1992, um, as part of an economic development program that included uh, the, the, the work, which is entirely unglamorous uh, office work and very light industry uh, around here, um, but also your artism. So often, the, the, the fun, so, so, so the fun and the work Again, at that scale, co-locate. If they're really separated, again, it might happen in the context of an incredibly auto-oriented society, and I'm not going to be able to find Six Flags without the search function. So, uh, so Six Flags. Where is Six Flags? And I'm going to uh, discover that it's not just in Jersey. It's it's something that it, yeah okay. So this is Six Flags. There's nothing there. Right, like this is what this is the surrounding land use. However, this is an incredibly, and I mean incredibly, auto-oriented society, suburban America. Uh, so uh, there's a freeway nearby, which means that essentially, if it's a day trip, you're going from the entirety of Jersey, parts of suburban Philly. Um, probably not Westchester, probably it's going to be too painful to drive over these bridges, but, I mean, Mazik has success. Um, and so, uh, so, so even that, I mean, you want to be near the customers. Uh, and yeah, um, if you're very auto-oriented, you do have the ability to build your thing in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but, um... Now the point is how to get that not to be very auto-oriented. And there, the point is that you really want this to work with a very urban population. Um, now, to go back to Six Flags for a sec, um, Jersey is very auto-oriented, but Jersey is not an economic unit. Jersey um, is... Most of Jersey is suburbs of New York and cities that have been captured by the New York orbit and their own suburbs, like New York. Um, the rest of Jersey is the same, is symmetric with what I just said about New York, but substitute Philadelphia and stuff. Um, and so it might be useful to talk about the New York region in general, because in the New York region, there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of fun things that are in the city. So let's talk about that for a moment because um, it, it matters what kind of fun there is. Uh, it matters how to get there to be more fun in the city, how to get there to be more fun that you can take a train to. So Six Flags 
you can tell by its location is a rather recent thing. Now I know now you can probably tell by how I'm talking that I don't know the history of Six Flags very well. It has to be way post war, right? Oh, founded nineteen sixty one. Okay. Um and apparently it started in Texas. Six flags over it's a Texas thing? So wait, where's the Jersey one from? Oh, 74. Okay. Okay, so the Six Flags in Jersey is from 74? Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, wow. I, I genuinely had no idea it originated in Texas. Um, anyway, so the point is that's in an era when uh, car ownership in the United States was basically universal. 1960s, 70s. Beforehand, though, you absolutely had these amusement parks within the city, and they were smaller. I mean, the, I mean that's literally Coney Island. I mean, maybe not now, uh, but there was once Coney Island. Um, and it's actually really important in the history of the New York City subway, because um, all of these lines in southern Brooklyn originate in excursion railways that were there to serve Coney Island, uh, even before, I think even before Luna Park opened, I think there was stuff like, uh, I think it was uh, for the boardwalk and the uh, uh, and um, seaside things that were before it became a, like the, before it became the amusement park. Uh, no, but even that is, I mean, that was in the late 19th century, which is, was not New York City because it was in Brooklyn and the city only annexed Brooklyn in 1898, but I mean, it was definitely part of the New York urban area. Um, it was commutable, evidently. Um, and so, yeah, the uh, so, so a lot of it was early things that were uh, often day trips by uh, rail. So, um, and yeah, day trips by car kind of extend that if you own a car. Um, and, th and then it's often based on things like what can you get to by the train within a day trip. The day trip bit is really important because uh, the, the, the cost of this, uh, the amount of planning effort you need to do, uh, rises very sharply if it's even an overnight rather than a day trip. Um, yeah, no, Coney Island, no, of course, Coney Island went in decline. I think it was during the war, some things collapse and then, or, or, or didn't work anymore, or just really burned, I forgot, and were, not, and were never repaired, and after the war, um, people had cars and could go to um, more modern places elsewhere, it's kind of like the history of streetcars, uh, and not just in the United States, also in, for example, Canada, uh, when, no, literally in uh, World War II Toronto, they told people, Yes, we know the streetcars are in a really bad shape. We're at war deal. Um, guess what happened to... N not all. Don't have the streetcar. Guess what happened to most of these streetcars um, after, after the war. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, you want to be within commute distance of the city for things that are land-intensive. Um, so the prices are always going to be like the the, the rent, the, the the land prices are going to be much lower outside the city than within the city. And actually, I, I know um, an event organizer in Jersey who I don't I think maybe once did something in Webster Hall uh, near Union Square, but most of the events were in Jersey and not downtown Newark either, but rather random places that still needed car shuttles from random central Jersey, New Jersey transit stations because these were not, you know, very ritzy, they were not, they was, these were not very high-end events. Yes, of course, um, if that's where you go to uh, and you have a tight budget, you're going to go to a random hotel near an office park um, on a weekend when people are just not going to use it for business meetings. Um, and there, and, and there, it's not really going to be a uh, a day trip, because um, it, it's kind of 
and I know that I'm thinking about it more, um, the sequence that permits auto-oriented suburbs to, and this is a very New York thing, you know, to some extent the rest of the United States, and, the, and by the rest of the United States I mean Chicago and Boston and San Francisco and Philadelphia, I don't mean like Texas. Um, the thing that let people, again, mostly in suburban New York, take advantage of city jobs with, uh, uh, with cars is they drive to a commuter train station and then the commuter train takes them from the station to Manhattan. Um, and the commuter rail timetables are designed exclusively around that use case, uh, uh, treating all other ridership not as less important, but often as negatively important, like specifically uh, letting go of that ridership just for simplicity. Uh, it's what happened with the commuter rail in the New York area in the 50s and 60s. And uh, it works as day trips. I mean, do, I mean, I think Mad I think Mad Men depicts some of those people as having pedators in the city so that they could cheat on their wives. I think it's, but I think it's just Pete Campbell on Mad Men. And Mad Men describes atypically wealthy people. So normally the behavior is you drive through the park and ride, take the train to the city, take the train back, drive from the park and ride home. That is something that works really well for the driver. Uh, um, this is something that works really well for uh, the suburban driver. Um, the suburban driver in this case doesn't even need to be especially familiar with the transit system because the, uh, I mean, only know a few things like, at L, uh, like on the LIR there's change in Jamaica culture or something like that. It's not, you don't need to be, you, you don't need to know a lot about where else the trains can go because it's really kind of a shuttle from the park and ride to Manhattan. And again, that works in the sense that people who live in the suburbs of New York and work in Manhattan uh, almost always take the train. By far the largest set of exceptions is people who live in this quadrant where there are no trains that go direct to Manhattan. And, the, um, and instead people have to transfer to Secaucus, which is an incredibly painful experience, not because it's a transfer, but because it's a, I think it's a change elevation twice and pass through Fairgates. Um, and with a lot of walking, whereas Jamaica transfers are across water. Um, and timed. And so we bring this up because now that we're thinking about this, I think more rigorously, I think it's, now that I'm thinking about this, doing the same sequence of steps in reverse is really difficult. And I think that is why it's difficult to have fun in these places, and again, Six Flags is one such example. Uh, there are others, for example, Jones Beach, um, kind of same thing. Um, it's really difficult to do that in reverse, because in reverse it means you live in the city, which, I don't know how many people live in New York these days, in the 2020 census it was nine million. So, yeah, you probably live in the city. Um, you want to do something fun that is not in the city, and you, what do you do? You can take the commuter train and from there, but but the fun will not ever be co-located with the train station because why? Um, if you're in Jersey and you're aiming at a, and you're aiming at a clientele from Jersey, they have cars. The advantage of being walking distance from the train station is not that much. Yes, it does let people from the city day trip, but the commuter trains are not very good for that. Um, and, um, and, and fundamentally that's still not most of your clientele, so you will go somewhere else. And then as soon as you need a car shuttle, nobody's going to do it as a day trip. People might organize a carpool, but usually it's for like a weekend event. Um, and again, once that happens, the, all of the costs of attending go up sharply because you need to pay for the hotel. Um, you need to pay for food at the hotel restaurant. It's always going to be more expensive. Uh, you're going to need to plan this out much more 
carefully in advance because it's not one day, it is several days. It's not something you can say on a whim, oh, yeah, we are feeling good this Saturday morning, let's go to something. Um, and so that's where I think there's this kind of disconnect where this, where again, it's, it's maybe a very specific New York thing where um, my impression is that the suburban fun attractions, it was incredibly rare for any of the communities that they moved in in the city to actually go there. Um, I think, I mean, I never went to Six Flags. I'm trying to think how many times um, I saw other grad students at Columbia go to Six Flags. It's not zero. I think it's once, maybe, in five years. I think I saw other people in the city years after do the same thing. So we're talking like something that happened twice, maybe three or four times if I'm forgetting something, um, through knowing hundreds of New Yorkers over many years. Um, it's just, again, not done um, because of the difficulty, because these are things that are only accessible by car. And in the city, the fuck do you own a car? I mean, if you're in grad school, why do you own a car? I mean, actually, I knew a grad student who owned a car, at this point, professor. Uh, but there was no way to keep the car in the city. The grand student kept the car with a relative who lived, I think, in Rye. This is Rye. Um, so it's just really hard to have that kind of fun be accessible to both the city and the suburbs. Um, so if you're thinking how that becomes more city accessible, it means doing more things in the city. Now, there are exceptions. The big exceptions are things that have to draw from everyone. Um, for example, sports stadiums. Uh, so often these are located in these kind of liminal regions where it's never going to be very central because sports stadiums are incredibly land intensive, but you can get them pretty close to the center. Um, but that still has to have a fair amount of highway access usually for the drivers. Like, look at Stade de France. Uh, freeway, freeway. Um, metro. I think there are two LL stations that are just not being shown. One of the LL, one of the, and by I think, I mean I'm literally seeing the station. So LL, LL. Um, so that's kind of a compromise location in case it's unclear. Like it's just, um, like walking from here to the LOL means crossing this. Uh, and you can kind of see how they're trying to make this a nice walk. There are trees. But you're still going on a freeway. Um, and, uh, the, and that's how you're getting to, to the train station. Um, but um, but and, and again, it's a compromise. It's not the trains being an afterthought. The, um, if they only cared about cars, they wouldn't put the stadium here. They would put it you know, here or something like the, this is still close enough to the city that there's going to be a lot of city traffic. Um, maybe not city traffic in the sense of traffic, um, Paris intramural cities and a lot of, uh, urban traffic jams, if that makes sense. So, so you have stadiums at compromised locations, uh, so this is an example. Um, this, goes a, this goes back a while. The sports stadium in Berlin, for example, the Olympia Stadion is uh, uh, here. Uh, and yeah, you can get there by train. The, um, there's an S-Bahn station. There's, a, there's, an, there, there's the S-Bahn, there's the U-Bahn. Uh, and uh, th so, th um, and but this area, the, the Spandau, I've heard more people tell jokes about how Spandau was not really in Berlin than how um, neighborhoods on the eastern margin of the city where IFD is the plurality party, by which I mean Melza and Hellersdorf, uh, how these, I've, I've not heard people say that Melza and Hellersdorf are not really in the, are not really Berlin, and I have heard people joke that way about Spandau. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, yeah, and and and, uh, and I want to add that um, your Disney specifically has the 
uh, circumferential algebra, so you can actually get there uh, from other parts of the Tejeva network. Um, you can again you can also get there from Paris, but that's really a matter of planning so that you're building the train at the same time as the uh, uh, as the fun. And again, you're not just building the fun. In, in an urban setting, you basically have to have everything co-located. And again, let, let's zoom, zoom in this. So yeah, this is just an Olympic village, but literally look at everything else around it. Like this is, like there's a fair amount of residential density. Uh, fairly close or not. I mean, this is still like a pretty wide expanse, don't get me wrong, but it's still embedded in a fairly dense environment. Like, this is, like, you're starting to get the, the Eurobox about a kilometer. Um, and, um, Spanda, and, and the center of Spandau is very urban. Uh, it's far, but it's urban. Uh, so, uh, the... So, so it's never going to be something that's truly single use because if you're building it in the city, you're building it in a situation with high land value, with high land values because there's a lot of productivity. There's a lot of stuff that the land could be used for housing uh, versus commercial establishments, um, of which to be very clear, the fun is the fun is not not commercial. Um, we can actually talk about non commercial fun, so that would be things. These are things that are usually more sacral. So it's always kind of weird to call them fun. Like, I don't remember when it was. It must have been over a year ago when I was talking about tourism by rail. Um, and, uh, and and I was talking about various things that could... Um, and and someone was talking about uh, um, Poland and Czechia and Pony in at replies pointed out that there are intercity trains that go through Auschwitz uh, and then joked that he refuses to call it by its more common name and then I pointed out, I mean, that, I mean, it's not nice to call it tourism, but I'm sorry, visiting Holocaust Memorial is a form of tourism. Um, I mean, there is, I mean, there is such a thing as, um, I mean, there is such a thing as Holocaust tourism. Uh, it, it's actually a really common thing when you uh, talk to uh, certainly Israelis, I think also um, American Jews, maybe also European Jews, then uh, when they visit a European city and uh, often one of the attractions they will look for, uh, they will look for is the local Holocaust uh, museum or memorial or, or whatever. I, at this point, have learned uh, how to how and what to recommend things in Berlin for for, for such people. Um, so even though these are incredibly sacral spaces, you can still use the expression tourism or leisure or fun to describe that. And um, and again, I said I'm not going to talk about inner city very much, but that's also something that you can do within the city. Um, I've had uh, day trips, for example, in Berlin to the to what I think is the good Holocaust Museum in Berlin. Uh, that's the Wannsee Conference House. This is one that's actually really hard to get to as well. Um, I think we have to take a bus rather than just walk. Uh, rather, and by had to, I mean, I would have walked it. Um, it's here, and the train station is here. So yeah, there is a bus. Um, on the way back, I think everyone on the bus was going from the museum to the train station. I heard Hebrew. Uh, and our... The and again, it's not. It's no. This is something that is there for his, for historical reasons, right? I mean, uh, it's because this is where this is the house where the Holocaust uh, was being planned. So I mean, you're not gonna cite it differently based on travel needs. It's actually a very, I would call it, low sacralization space. Again, I think it's better than the let's call them higher sacralization spaces. Uh, for uh, uh, Holocaust memorialization in Germany, where often they would try to do things like get a, uh, a famous architect um, to run things. This was a big thing that has been done in the Jewish Museum of Berlin. This is 2.2 kilometers. Uh, or the um, Concrete Column Memorial, this one. Um, and 
uh, um, yeah, so, so this is, for example, a very sacral space. Usually sacral spaces will be, uh, uh, sacral spaces will usually be, oh yeah, of course, yeah, of course. Uh, so usually very sacral spaces um, are going to be atypically city center uh, focused. So in Berlin, if I'm showing you that the Holocaust Memorial uh, is it, it is um, between Brandenburger and Potsdam Platz, that's not surprising because Berlin is I'm not going to call it monocentric because it has many centers, they're just all within the ring. Uh, Berlin is very strongly centered, uh, but that's also drawn very weakly centered cities. Um, so the museums, uh, the, uh, the, the various memorials, um, except with the exceptions for memorials slash museums that are uh, in historically significant locations. So that would be things like Dachau, in suburban Munich, which I don't think is a good museum, or the uh, uh, or the Wannsee Conference House Museum, which I think is very good, uh, or uh, or Auschwitz, um, or um, just war memorials, often or uh, a specific place where a battle occurred. I mean, commemorati commemoration of the Battle of Gettysburg is in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, right? I mean. I mean, I'm sure there. I mean, I'm sure you can see commemoration in many museums uh, dedicated to uh, American history or uh, African American history or military history or slavery. Uh, but at the end of the day, Gettysburg, the, the Battle of Gettysburg, was fought in Gettysburg. It was not fought in Washington D.C. Um, so in Washington D.C., the, so 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 with that, so so accepting that, uh, the more sacral spaces, um, which. Again, it's often, and by often I mean always, incredibly rude to call them fun, but for all intents and purposes, they're um, leisure destinations. Um, it's the same as fun, except you feel sad. Uh, and so in, in DC, for example, there's this entire museum row, uh, two rows out there. Um, so this is a very high sacralization space, the, the, um, the Smithsonian, uh, complex. Um, and DC is not Berlin, it's not New York. It's a much more auto-oriented place. Uh, it's, a, it's, a much, it's, a, it's a much more auto-oriented city. Um, quite a lot of the production in Washington is not in the city, um, but rather in um, suburban office parks, things like Tyson's, uh, Bethesda. Um, and, uh, and yet, the very sacral spaces will be in the city center. Uh, and these are often accessed by train, and again, it's going to be a day trip from the suburbs, things like parking at the park and ride, or maybe uh, having the entire family get into a car and um, paying a lot for parking. Uh, and this is, this is something where just this is extra stuff that's in the city where you can take trains to, that's not... It, it, often you don't build special public transportation infrastructure because it's so central that the existing system already serves it. I mean, the look, look at how many Washington metro stations there are in this area. Th this may be called Smithsonian, I'm not sure, but there are several comp points here that are uh, closer to other stations. Yeah, Smithsonian, yeah. But this, if I'm going to the National Gallery, I'm probably, uh, I'm probably taking the train to archives. Um, depending on which line it is, though. Uh, so, uh, and it's the same with the big draws in, let's say, New York, um, Berlin, Paris, whatever. Uh, so for these, it's just really just a matter of kind of let's call it thickening the city. Uh, Philadelphia, by the way, I think Philadelphia is even more suburbanized than Washington. It is like the, most of most economic production in Philadelphia is not in Philadelphia. Um, the fun is also things like, uh, historically, as people men are mentioning in the comments, Atlantic City, uh, a lot of other things in various suburbs, King of Prussia. Um, King of Prussia is a really, really good example where um, the uh, economic production and the fun, in the fun in this case, is a giant shopping mall, uh, tend to co uh, Ooh, 
Yeah. Yeah, um, so, yeah, so I should mention that um, there are these excursions by Kumi Rail, and yeah. Um, Harper's Ferry is something that I've heard of, and you probably know better than I do. I don't know it well. Uh, the things that I know somewhat better are uh, um, New York, not to Jersey, the, the um, fine Jersey, maybe the Jersey Shore it is, but I can't ever think of anyone who used... New Jersey transit from the city to use these beaches because New Yorkers uh, have the subway to Rockaway Park, or in theory, LIR in practice driving to Long Beach, to to Jones Beach rather. Well, Long Beach is LIR, um, but stuff like uh, Appalachian Trail, um, you absolutely can uh, take the train up to any the uh, to um, Appalachian Trail stations or let's say to Poughkeepsie. Um, I've day tripped to New Haven many times. I have family there. Uh, Boston to Providence is a day trip. Uh, Boston to uh, Plymouth, although the Plymouth station at this point has been basically gutted. There's the downtown Plymouth station is closed. The station that's called Plymouth is a couple of kilometers uh, north of that, and most trains, by which I mean, I think all but like two per day serve a parking lot called Kingston, but in theory, if they restore that, they could have trains to Plymouth, which has a lot of historic things. Um, Boston to Salem is actually a big thing on Halloween. Um, so th that is a thing that happens on commuter rail. Um, if the commuter train happens to connect to something of, in this case it would be historic significance, Salem, Plymouth especially, and that's usually not a coincidence. Usually if a place has uh, historic significance, it means it was a significant enough uh, city when the railways were being built in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, so it's likelier that there's going to be a train there. Um, uh, so, and... Uh, but yeah, all the but, but the really important principle is uh, it needs to be a day trip. Uh, the usually the system of park and ride of park and rides just sucks for this really bad because the uh, because while for the area drivers a place like the Kingston Park and Ride, let me just show you what the Kingston Park and Ride is in case you don't believe me that it's terrible. Um, the the Kingston Park and Ride, which is here. Uh, it's very useful for commuters to Boston, but it's useless for anyone else. Where the hell would you go here? Maybe to a shuttle to Plymouth? But again, that complicates the arrangement so much because the whole point of this kind of more successful car train interface is that it works when it's your own car near your own home. So maybe you live around here and you drive to Kingston. It's an, uh, so you're driving on familiar roads familiar streets, um, and you have your own car, uh, and the, um, and, but in the opposite direction, it's not going to be your own car. Um, now, in the Netherlands, uh, there is a practice by cyclists of keeping two bikes, home bike and destination bike. This is because in the Netherlands, uh, bike usage is so high that they cannot allow people at scale uh, to use uh, to, to bring bikes on trains. Now, some bike rail interface systems do allow that in Germany, for example. Uh, but when bike ridership is sufficiently high, the bikes will uh, overwhelm the available space on the train. And as a result, uh, there's bike parking. And the so the practice in, the, in a bike country like the Netherlands is that uh, people who commute by train will often have uh, will often have a bike for home and they will buy a separate bike uh, to be used around the city where they work, let's say Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and so on. Um, and, uh, but, but that works because it's still your own bike. Second, really importantly, bikes cost probably about two orders of magnitude less than cars. Uh, now, Jokes about bikes being stolen aside, the cost of what, the, the economic and thus emotional cost to you when your bike is stolen is significantly lower than when your car is stolen. 
not because you anthropomorphize, not because you anthropomorphize your car more than you do your bike. I mean, you do, but you do because the car is like because a new car costs what is it, thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars, and a bike costs what five hundred, not five hundred thousand, five hundred bucks, if that. I mean, I'm sure you can um, spend low for figures if you're spending uh, if you're spending money on a really high-end sports bike or something, but. Um, sure, you can you can also spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on the car if uh, you uh, enjoy uh, if you enjoy especially big or especially fancy ones. It's a whole point of a car. It's a symbol of consumption where you actually are capable of spending more money to get something that is somewhat better and uh, somewhat better on like physical quality and much better on status. Um, which you can't on public transit. I mean, you can ride first class, but um, the, the the status gain from riding first class on, let's say, the Tejever Itze or Green Cornish and Continent is not that much. It's like you're not showing off to everyone, look how rich I am that I'm uh, driving a very high end uh, BMW or some shit. Um, yeah, you can, okay, you get a, sh a shitty beaker beaker bike for a hundred bucks. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And my understanding is that the bikes in the Netherlands tend to be low end because they're uh, because people who are not avid cyclists use them. So, um, what's the point of getting all the all the fancy gears? So yeah, you put two bikes. Yeah, there it's likely that your bike in Amsterdam or your bike at home will be stolen pre periodically. Okay, you replace it. It costs what is it? A hundred euros? Two hundred euros? Okay. Um, you don't want to spend the two hundred euros, but if you know that this happens once every year or two, you will live. Uh, if people who owned cars knew that the car would be likely stolen every two years and very few people would actually be willing to own a car. Um, so there's the two, so you can do the two bike system also, and you can't do the two car system. Uh, also separately bikes consume very little space, which means that um, you actually can have cities, uh, sorry, not cities, train stations embedded in a city that have tons and tons and tons of bike parking in Amsterdam, in uh, Copenhagen, in Tokyo. Uh, and uh, uh, whereas if you have thousands of car parking spots, I mean, you can show you what thousands of car parking spots at a train station look and uh, ask you to be, and then ask you to judge um, whether anyone ever goes to that train station unless they live there and the car that is parked is their own. Um, this is the station. Uh, now, here's a question to people who know this area. Does anyone ever take the train to the station if they don't live in this area? Um, now, before, uh, now, I'm not, I'm not gonna, uh, Wait for for chat about this. Sorry, the answer is by the way yes, but that's not for ever going to Princeton Junction itself, but for uh, transferring, which is a time transfer to Princeton. So Princeton is a destination. I wouldn't call it fun. I don't think there's anything there especially fun. It's usually uh, trips that are. It's usually academic trips. So uh, you go to a seminar talk. Maybe you're giving the talk. Maybe you're going to someone else's talk. Um, so that's maybe not commercial, but I would call it a work trip not a, uh, or maybe a bit, it, it's, it, again, it's one of these things kind of uncouth to call it a business trip in the same way that um, uh, going to visit Holocaust Memorial is, is kind of uncouth to call it uh, tourism, let alone fun, and yet that's what it is, uh, or, or leisure. Um, so, th so this is a work destination. Um, this is the transfer point. But to this as a destination, no, no. This is what thousands of parking of car parking spots look like. So you can't have it at the city end. That's not going to happen. Ever. Um, the other thing is also if it's a fun, if it's a leisure trip, by definition, leisure trips are not your usual trip. Um, what this means is that uh, there's no point to ever keep something at the park and ride if you are not a if you're not a daily user. Um, so nobody's ever gonna get their own uh, car for the exclusive purpose. There's no nobody's gonna keep their own car parked permanently at Kingston 
for the exclusive purpose of uh, for, for the exclusive purpose of driving it to to Plymouth. That's insane. Um, people don't do this as a daily trip. If you're, if for whatever reason you're going to Plymouth every day, you will just live in Plymouth. It's okay to live in Plymouth. Plymouth is not very negatively stereotyped, this is the area. Uh, it's also substantially cheaper than living in Cambridge or, or Boston. So just live here. If you're if this is your daily destination, you're not gonna move you're not gonna you're not going to commute from Boston, you're probably going to live here. If you and if you have a two body problem, let's say you need to be here every day and you have a partner who needs to be in Boston every day, well the commuter train system is already geared for um suburb to city commuting, so obviously you're gonna live in Plymouth. Um so the uh so, so this system is really so, so this system which can again work for commutes, works very poorly for fun trips. Um, like uh, in this case, it would be historic visits to uh, Plymouth. I don't think Plymouth is like kind of classical fun. Like, I don't think there are amusement parks there or anything like that. Um, I think actually, I, mean, I know a living statue who sometimes goes there, but my understanding is that her main uh, place is and is I mean was when I uh, last lived in the area, which was. Uh, 11 point something years ago was Providence. Um, Providence has water fire. Water fire is pretty traditional fun. Um, and again, it's, it's fun that's associated to an, to a city center that's not predominantly fun oriented. But, um, uh, and, and that is something where it would be better if MPTA schedules were uh, more frequent uh, weekend evenings. But, uh, but, but even the, but even if, even if uh, even if Plymouth is not normal fun, it's still leisure trips. Uh, historic trips should really be uh, folded into that. Um, and I don't think of Plymouth trips as especially sacral. It's not again a Holocaust memorial. Uh, it's not like a religious pilgrimage. Uh, and so yeah. Um, so what you really want to do is try to try to place them in the city when you can, which means. Definitely giving people more reasons to visit the city in general. Um, and DC actually has again a row of museums. Often you want these to co-locate because um, uh, people can even do two museums in a single day, or and, and that way you're also going to uh, uh, be open to tourists um, because the tourist, the tourists from uh, tourists not necessarily from a, a different country but from far away. Uh, will probably stay in your city center, and then you want, and then they will do things during their couple of days in the city. Um, you want so so you want the fun to be sufficiently co-located that it can attract tourists. Uh, so so you want the kind of high density urbanization for that. Um, often not using public transit that much, but using walking. Like I like I don't think the point is that uh, each metro station has a different museum. New York has a little bit of that in Manhattan, but um, if if some tourists take taxis, it's fine. Like, I mean, it's embedded in a system that's predominantly rail-based. That's predominantly um, public transportation. So when I say rail, I mean subway. Uh, for things like um, Noma, the Mat, M H, things like the usual like uh, big uh, high-end New York museums. And again, it's, this is not just New York. I mean, it's the same thing with. Berlin museums, uh, Paris museums. I don't think are as located. Paris museums. Um, I mean, where are they? The I mean, often in Paris, there's also a historic element where specific specific things are being placed. So things like the Louvre here, Musée d'Orsay. I will never. Uh, I, w I wanted to say we'll never find the Saint Pompidou, but it's so architecturally different from the rest of the city that you can literally just see it on satellite where it is. Let's see here. Um, I don't remember where the Holocaust Memorial is. I think it's somewhere in the Bavay. Um, so again, that would be a uh, historic, things of historic significance because uh, Jewish neighborhood, historic Jewish neighborhood. Uh, and, uh, and often these are kind of random places in the city, if you don't know the history and you just look at it on a map, um, but that's fine. I mean, people travel around Paris. That's fine. That's normal. Uh, 
I mean, sure, but it's not necessarily tourists getting confused by this. It's just, I mean, tourists often take taxis. It's not just a New York thing. But at the same time, I don't think people rent a car just to drive around New York or Paris. So among the tourists who take cabs, the actual driving distances are short. Um, and again, this is where I'm, uh, I'm talking about how it's important that it's embedded in a rail-oriented system. Um, cars, um, like trains, are more jammed to trash hour than not to trash hour. In fact, um, in New York, because I know it from the Hubbound report, in New York, the public transportation ridership is peakier than car ridership, um, which actually makes sense. I mean, when you think about it, if you're um, traveling at noon, cars are relatively better because there's less traffic, whereas the trains, yeah, they're less crowded, but they're also less frequent. Uh, and crowding doesn't really stop people except at extreme levels that do exist in New York, but not in most of the, uh, but not most of New York. Uh, Oh yeah, no, no, there, there are lots of, oh, oh, in Tivoli Gardens, okay, so I don't, so we didn't go to Tivoli Gardens, I'm pretty sure they were, I'm forgetting whether it's because we felt like we didn't have time or because they were uh, under construction, they, they, they were doing renovations when we had that in August, but yeah, no, obviously there are, there are examples, I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, Musée d'Orsay is literally on top of the RER, it's a former train station. In fact, the first um, electrified mainline urban rail terminal in world history in 1900, um, because the because Gardo Stellitz was only for intercity trains, and then they, uh, before they realized that they could just connect the lines, when they, but they did understand at the time that they needed to do better urban penetration to improve the quality of rail. So for the commuter trains, they actually um, built this line uh, from Austerlitz to Gardo uh, where they, uh, and, and I keep hovering here as if this is, what's that? no, this is Galdo, so this is Emily. Uh, to, so, so they kept going to Galdo, to, to Galdo Se, which is just much better located uh, relative to the absolute center of, of Paris than the Nostalites, and this was electrified. This was mostly, if not entirely, in town. Um, and, um, uh, or, or in New York, I mean, MoMA is, MoMA is not at a train station, but it's in a part of Midtown where everything is near the subway. Um, the British uh, Library. Uh, the, the British Library is, uh, I'm forgetting whether it is on top of St. Pancras, or just mere or merely close enough that if you stand on a specific stand there you can see the really pretty yeah this is St. Pancras this is the British Library uh the British Library is awesome if you uh climb I'm forgetting one of these things is climbable uh like maybe this and from there you can you can see the railroad hotel over this building and it's really pretty. Um, generally I find London rather ugly, but this is specifically very pretty vista in London. Uh, so yeah, no, sometimes the fun places like going to the library for uh, uh, their exhibits uh, or for, uh, uh, in this case, just using the library as intended, you know, borrowing books. Uh, uh, and and the, and the, yeah, of course, it could be near a train station. Again, this is okay. This is being this being central on base. Um, most locations are going to be somewhere near the tube. This just happens to be right on top of I think like the number three busiest tube station, King's Cross and Pancras. Um, I know that at one point it was the busiest, but maybe Victoria and Waterloo overtook it. Since I don't remember. Um, and all of my numbers are pre-corona, so they're kind of trash. And by implication also pre-crossrail, uh, so it's possible that uh, um, so, so it's possible that other stations have grown busier just because they have crossrail connections. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, that's pretty 
normally that's not even a matter of urban planning because again it's central London this okay if you're telling me if uh, somehow literally any of these random buildings is turned into a big fun destination like a uh, new museum uh, hopefully one that uh, does not rely on uh, things that were literally stolen from the colonies uh, or, uh, okay, okay, this is, just looking at what Google is showing me, Charles Dickens Museum. Uh, now, not knowing the history of London at the level of detail of knowing what happened on each street, there are people who know that history. I am not among them. Uh, I can't tell you whether it's a random location or whether it maybe Dickens lived here. Uh, again, I don't know the history well enough to tell you what street address Dickens lived on. Uh, at you live on a street and at an address. Sorry for my uh, uh, so sorry for my uh, uh, non-native English things. Um, and and it's this again, same in central Paris, same in uh, Manhattan. From maybe not as far north as I manage and. Uh, uh, and, and the Met, which are kind of annoying to get to east-west, um, but certainly from 60th Street south. Uh, again, it's, it's often just something that's, that arises from the large number of destinations, uh, or often work destinations, or from the local destinations. So, the, um, so, so yeah, obviously, if you do f things, if you do bits of fun that are not, you know, world-famous museums, often you will, I mean, I mean, probably if it's not something that's very high-end, you will not want to pay the rent of Midtown Manhattan, and yet, often you're going to end up meeting in a place that's fairly central. Um, the the um, places of fun that I know in Berlin, uh, nearly all of them are within the ring. Uh, now, I'm going to spend, especially as to fun, so not things like museums, so I'm not, so the exception is not the exception is um, the very specific queer event space. Uh, but usually, um, now, Queer Berlin, it's actually something I kind of want to talk about. Um, queer Berlin, at least when I talk to people um, and like they actually tell me what they do, is kind of bourgeois. But only kind of. Um, most people don't have what I will call a middle class job. They uh, quite a lot have uh, intermediate uh, have jobs that are called intermediate professions in France. So quite a lot are teachers, um, and uh, so something like teachers, nurses, uh, lab techs, things like that. These these are intermediate professions. So it's often people in these. Um, but there's also actual working class, also quite a lot of people with um, uh, periodic bouts of unemployment, um, chronic or, or chronic illness. It's something that um, there's a lot of intersection between that and queerness. Um, I don't think they physically are like, I don't think that queer people are likelier to be physically ill and vice versa, but rather um, both spaces, but both. Um, disability communities and queer communities are uh, spaces where it's much more acceptable to talk about one's own body, um, which is not something that is normally a, an appropriate topic of discussion in more mainstream middle-class communities. And as a result, it's okay to be openly disabled and demand certain accommodations in queer spaces. Um, and vice versa, talk about being queer and uh, uh, in anything in disability community spaces. Um, so, um, so, so they're not pushed out. Is the point? Um, so they're still there. Um, so this is not people. It's not, so it's a pretty. So it's not like some kind of the cry of the poor and homeless, but people who live in squats exist. I mean, not many because not many Berliners live in squats, but I'm pretty sure. Um, that in queer spaces they've met a disproportionate share of Berliners who live in squats. Um, and again, there's, it's still, I think, more bourgeois than average, but pretty, imp pretty wide cross-section, and also more importantly, 
because it's ideological, it's not bourgeois. Like it's this kind of mentality that anything that's exclusively middle class is to be shunned. It means that spending a lot of money um, is kind of frowned upon. So you don't. So you will not meet at high end restaurants, for example. So, but even then, um, the event spaces tend to be central. Um, not central, maybe not central in the sense of being your fifth salsa, but again, I won't say inside the ring, but in, but it's kind of misleading to draw this when you say inside the ring. It should be more like this. Like it's not something that you that really that the people really go to will, will go to show out and book for. Um, and so the so when you say fun again, this could be clubs. Uh, but it could just be meetups. It could be like literally meeting a bunch of friends to do something. Like literally just want or, or at some point just like literally going to watch a movie. Um, and obviously that's such a neighborhood scale amenity that it essentially is just where people live. Um, and people I don't think people travel long distances to watch a film. Maybe maybe if it's because it's a uh, like a, a, an opening night and there's a specific opening gala for let's say Hollywood production in LA where um, the uh, director and the producer and the uh, and, and the actors are all going to be there as kind of a way of selling the film then yeah maybe uh, if you're uh, p presumably presumably they don't let randos go into these into these opening galas but Maybe if you're in the industry but you don't live in Hollywood, let's say you're a uh, British director, um, and you want and you're and, and you are willing and able to be at the gala for an opening of the film, uh, and, and and the opening gala is in Hollywood, then you will fly from London to LA for that. Uh, but that's such a corner case for watching films; it's long. Um, so it's mostly just. So, so so when I say fun again, I mean things that um, I, I, I I'm specifically talking about in, in, about the setting in Berlin of things that are um, places where people actually go for some kind of enjoyment rather than let's say something more educational like with museums. But even then, um, but even then we, we see that kind of centralization again. Not maybe maybe not with um, movie theaters. I imagine the the cinemas. I imagine that I just know the cinemas. Um, inside the ring, east of U6, because I live and socialize in Berlin, east of U6, inside the ring. Um, and people in Mozart have cinemas in Mozart, people in Spandau have cinemas in Spandau. Uh, but again, these are very local things, but also, but then the regional things, the things that people do actually travel longer distances to, these are in, uh, these are these tend to be city center. When, sorry, when this is a transit city. Um, again, in the United States is very different, but because but that's because in the United States um, there's often this kind of bifurcation between urban and suburban fun, just because the commuter trains, as I mentioned multiple times, the way the system is set up, it's basically incapable of delivering urbanites to suburban destinations, um, unless the destination happens to be you know a convention center in downtown Newark or, or something that's walking distance from the Providence, from Providence station or something, or something like that, which is pretty rare. Uh, and now the commentaries are capable of delivering suburbanites to city destinations, uh, but on weekends and in the evenings, which is usually when you go for fun things, uh, they're not good. It's not as hopeless as urban to suburban travel because urban to suburban travel has all of the problems with frequency of service, uh, but also the, the problem of having uh, the of having to get from the park and ride to the actual destination. Uh, but even that, I mean, the, the frequency problem is real for the suburbanites, and if they don't want to, and, and these are maybe people who are. I don't know, maybe more willing to just forego public transit entirely because they're not used to it as much because they're mostly drivers. Um, so even even though it's easier for a Jersey or a Long Islander to do fun in the city than the reverse, probably the numbers in both cases are very low just because um, the uh, New Yorker will uh, 
stick through the train at higher levels of pain than the Long Islander or the um, Jerseyite. Do you say Jersey or Jersey? Prague um, or, or other people like here. How how do you call a person who lives in Jersey? Is it Jerseyite? It's on New Jersey, New Jersey. Oh, New jersey -ian? But most people, I guess, say Jersey, I don't know. New Yorker half of the time, ah, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so to be clear, a person who uh, lives on the wrong side of the Hudson is not in New York. Uh, now, a person who lives in, on Staten Island, we can discuss that another time. Um, but certainly people in Jersey cannot call themselves New Yorkers. Sorry, not sorry. But yeah, I got it. Like, I get it a lot of those people who um, have been displaced from New York due to insane rents and then live in places that actually build housing, which I mean Jersey. Um, but yeah, so, um, the, so anyway, that's all I have to say at this point about fun and trans and just how, um, like, I wasn't sure where I was going with this, but actually with the, thinking about this more carefully, the part where, um, the park and ride system leads to bifurcation of urban and suburban fun, I think it's really important. It's not something that I've seen in Europe, again, in Europe. Bear in mind, the stadiums that I showed you that are in all these liminal, urban, or suburban spaces, that's also in the metal. In two years, that's going to be the, two and a half years, it's going to be the World Cup final. Um, specifically, it's going to be here. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. And by fun, I don't mean the World Cup is going to be fun. Maybe it will be, maybe it won't be. Uh, but the transportation issues of trying to get people out of it as soon as it's over are going to be fun. Um, yeah, so uh, so this is not exactly a Europe-US difference, uh, that the stadiums are in the middle. So there's a lot, bear in mind, I mean, this is a mu like the, the, the quality of public transit to the Netherlands is so much worse to a place like Stratford or Stade de France or Olympia Stadion. Um, and um, that I think it does matter. Uh, the, the kind of the liminality here is places that are genuinely pretty accessible by uh, both cars and transit. And I mean, the access is not very fun. I mean, um, going there, going back, often you're, like, I mean, going back, often there's, so there's something called Condrop, where after a very fun gaming convention or, or fandom convention and you're in kind of drop because you are now stuck in a car with in, in the carpool or stuck on a uh, on a train going back home uh it's it's not just about transportation it's just the, the part where it's over and so it's kind of weird people were starting to talk i think before sort of recording about how the trip itself can be fun but that's only if you're a rail fan otherwise the, I, otherwise i don't think the, the trip is going to be fun um, the trip back at least, um, because again, you're in drop. Um, and if you're going back from the beach, uh, you will have sand in your sandals. Uh, and you know exactly which cities, beaches I'm talking about, just by the footwear that I'm not showing, I hope. Um, and you think you can avoid having sand in your sandals? No, you can't. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's the main thing that I have to say about this. Um, do people have questions or comments? This is not a very late stream, if that makes sense. So people who have comments are welcome, not just questions. Like if this were nine, I would tell people just ask questions and be quick about it.
Okay, so we have 16 seconds of lag. Okay, we can let it happen. If people don't have questions, then thank you all for uh, watching. Um, thank you all for bearing with me on a pretty random short notice topic. Oh, sorry. When is it okay to locate a stadium in city center? Never. Like, stadiums are too land intensive. You, they don't go here. I mean, they might go closer in an Olympia Stadion, but they don't go around for the shots. They don't go in Midtown Manhattan. They don't go in. Like if it's like maybe if it's in something enclosed, you can get away with that, like Madison Square Garden. But that's basketball, and basketball is genuinely more compact. Um, so you can actually fit it in like two blocks, in two Manhattan blocks, whereas a football stadium needs more space, or, or a baseball stadium needs more space. Um, like. This is huge. No way does this go in. The, no, I mean, if the, you could put this in Manhattan, but I mean, inward Manhattan, I don't mean like, you know, what people usually think of when they say Manhattan. I once, I once lived with someone um, who uh, used it. We, we were living in uh, West Harlem. Maybe not West Harlem. It's hard to say. We, was, let's call it Central Harlem, was right at the bottom of the park. Who used the expression, who, who, while living in Manhattan, used the expression to go to the city to mean to go to either Midtown or a little bit north of Midtown. Uh, and also would use the expression the red line or the orange line or the blue line to refer to the subway. And to be clear, this is someone who, uh, this is a lifelong New Yorker. Um, So Lansdowne is too close to the center. Lansdowne, I mean, maybe, like, I mean, it's there, and um, the jokes about how uh, the location is why the stadium is a little bit weird and that's why the Red Sox can't win are funny. Um, I don't even know if the Red Sox are not winning. I genuinely don't know. But this is not that central. I mean, it's not, I mean, Boston's just not a large city. It's close to, ba like, the thing is, the job sprawl, like, the, I mean, Back Bay is kind of in that direction, but if you take the, but, like, it's not that close to downtown Boston. It's, like, 3 point something kilometers. It's, like, I mean, okay. Again, not a very large city. Like, it's, like, I wouldn't say kick it out, but, um, and, and, and but if it didn't exist, probably it would be built somewhere a little farther out. But I mean, it's not a kick it out it's squatting on a valuable land clothes. Um, yeah, oh, 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 you're talking about uh, Potomac Yards? Yeah, so with Potomac Yards, I mean, so my understanding of the sports issues related to Potomac Yards is non-existent. My understanding with Potomac Yards is mostly it's outraging me that uh, they're building an infill stop on the Metro at Potomac Yards. Um, I guess here, and I would not have been able to pick out the location if I didn't have the label. This looks like the development area? Yeah. So it's a bunch of things, not just a, not just um, a sports stadium. And it's it's not even that central. It's in Alexandria, it's not in the district. I mean, it's like this is the distance to the district. No, it's mostly the outrage is that the infill metro station here, I believe, cost four hundred million dollars to build. This is at grade. Um, an appropriate amount of money for an at grade infill station where you do have space for platforms. It's probably about 15, 20. If it's really high end, I can see 25, but these are not very long trains. Actually, maybe these are long trains. Okay, 20, 25. This cost 400. Okay. 
in a soul in 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 soul this blog post they wrote like eleven years ago and I was seeing some people in uh, Korean media uh complain about the extravagance of a certain infill station in Seoul. Uh, they said it was really expensive. It was I think maybe eighty million dollars underground infill. And they were trying to compare it negatively with some DC construction, except like DC can't build at anything approaching that cost even at grade level on underground. It's kind of funny how the uh, Korean media thinks that Korean government spending is really extravagant. Yeah, okay, you have to, yeah, okay, you have to walk over a bunch of weird sky bridges. Yeah, okay. Sky bridge here and here do not cost $400 million. Um, I'm sorry. Um, unless for some reason it's really important to you that uh, the sky bridge be built out of a solid gold. Um, maybe some diamond studying as well. Uh, then uh, this does not cost four hundred million dollars. Um, like yeah, I get it. You need to go over the railway. Wait, can we have a conversation for a moment about how, for some reason, they spend four hundred million dollars and there's still only one usable exit? Um, because that is not good. Or maybe there's a, an under, or is, or is this? Oh, maybe this is an underpass, so this is also a usable exit. Okay. Um, but it's not crossing, so you can't go here. Only here. Four hundred million dollars. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this is my, my main take on uh, Potomac Yards is why the fuck is this $400 million? Uh, rather than uh, anything about the separation between sports, stadiums, and, and city center. I know there's a, there's a bunch of fighting in Philadelphia over the same thing. Um, over uh, not, not not even the same thing. Something much more central. They want to uh, I think demolish. Uh, I'm trying to remember if trying to demolish. If, if, is it part of is it part of Market East to uh, build an arena? I think it's a basketball arena maybe. Um, you're trying to build and uh, or, or and uh, there's a lot of controversy about how. It's just not going to generate a lot of revenue for a place that's that central. Um, we were trying to be very hedging about it when Inga Sanford talked to me about this, and then the people who I trust the most on this fifth square are like absolutely against that, against the organization. Um, or if there are other questions. Yep. Yeah, I just again, I didn't remember. I thought it was Market East, but I, I had the same problem when I was talking to Inga about this. That I didn't. That it took me a while to even know the exact uh, coordinate of this. Um, if people don't have further questions, um, then we could end here. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, I will see you once again in either four days or in a week. Um, in the next one, in a, uh, on a topic to be on a topic to be determined. So thank you all for tuning in, and. Uh, 
Tschüss.